so this is lecture 11 of ECE 2305. And today's lecture, it's going to be all things linked layer. So what we're going to be talking about mostly in today's lecture is a little bit of like the terminology and the design of a linked layer in a communication system. And one of the core modules for a linked layer is going to be error detection and correction. Right? So the link layer, there's a lot of terminology. There are the nodes, right? These guys are essentially your host, your router, anything that receives or transmits data. Then you also have the links. So what happens is we virtualize the connections between these nodes. So we don't think of like um, air medium or wired medium or anything like that. We know that's there and it has some sort of corruption. But what happens is the links we sort of abstract it. We say, yes, we know that the data is on these links. They're probably going to experience some sort of corruption. And we, the, what the link layer does is it says, is this data reliable? Can we count on it? Are there any errors? And if there is, can we clean it up? Right? And so what we're going to see later on in this lecture is also mechanisms for using redundancy to clean things up. Right? So if there's an error, can we? recover the information that's lost. There's also something called frames. And what frames are is the way that the link layer packages everything, right? So what we have here, we have nodes. So that's source and destinations. It could also relay in the case of a router. We have the links. Those are the things that connect the nodes. And we have the frames, which is the data or the information that's transmitted from node to node to node to node over those links. Now, the responsibility okay, for transferring frames from one node to another node over a link. That's what this entire framework is all about. And what happens is the link layer at the nodes is responsible for cleaning things up and detecting if there's any errors. So here's this analogy. Okay? Just in case you're saying, what's a frame? What's a link? I think I, think I made my point, but I'm just going to reiterate with like, I'm not sure how many people have traveled from here to New York City. Any people travel to New York City, New York City? Isn't that cool that you can take Peter Pan bus or something or Greyhound? It's great. Well, you know, you're waddling along for three and a half hours and stuff. So I can take that experience and translate it into what we refer to as the link layer. So trip to WPI to New York City, what happens is you have SNAP. SNAP takes you to Union Station. The train, or you take a bus, takes you from Union Station to Logan Airport, and then the plane takes you from Logan Airport to JFK. That's a little bit roundabout. I would rather take from Union Station, I would take the bus to, um, what is it? Whatever the bus terminal is in downtown. Which one? Port Authority. In Manhattan, Port yep. Authority. Oh, a Port Authority. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because I'm saying it's, it's real, and it's on 48th Street, right? Oh. Somewhere around there. So. That pretty, and then afterwards, you're there. You're in Manhattan, right? So let's, there's some terminology here. Datagram, that's you. You're that payload. You're that information that you're trying to communicate from one node to another. So fancy name. We have the frame. The frame wraps around the datagram. The frame is sort of the construct that contains the data. There might also be some header information, some information that says, oh, in addition, to the data, there's all this other information, which we'll use later to correct for any corruption. There's the link. So that's the transport segment. That's the bus. That's the plane. That's SNAP. And then finally, the nodes are where you have like sort of source, destination, source, destination, source, destination. I know. This is a very corny uh, analogy. Ah! So framing. So what framing is, you're encapsulating the datagram. And what you're doing is, you, from that network layer, so you get that information from the network layer, you're wrapping it into a frame, and then you add a header and a trailer. Most of the time, it's a header. The header will contain a variety of different information, including source and destinations um, at, at uh, that layer and the lower layers. And then at the same time, it might contain also uh, redundant information that you're going to use later to recover any missing information, any corrupted information. And we talked about a few lectures ago, one of the first lectures, TCP IP and the network architecture, the protocol architecture, the MAC address, right? And all of us have this. 
So if you take your cell phone, so if you take your iPhone, you take your Windows 7 phone, you take, uh, is it Windows 7? Or whatever, like, you know, basically your Windows phone, you take your Android phone, what you can do is you just unlock it. I'm not going to say my password. And then you go to settings, you go to about, and then you go under like network interface. So let's see, general, yes. And then about phone. Usually that works. And what you're going to find is underneath the part that says network. Yeah. So you have an IP address, and it looks like this has IVP, um, IPv4 uh, and IVP6. But you also have things like this weird pairing of numbers. So you have like a 9 and an E, colon, 4, D, colon, and so on and so forth. This is what we call a MAC address, right? So the MAC address is how we uniquely identify the link layer of a node, right? So we know that from the network layer, we use IP addresses, right? That uniquely identifies the computer. But the hardware, right, that does the actual, like your, eth your Ethernet card, your wireless adapter, if you open up any of your laptops, your iPads and stuff, you're going to find this hex, hexadecimal, combination of digits, and this uniquely identifies this guy. Now, it tries to uniquely identify. There is something called um, uh, MAC address spoofing. So let's say, for instance, at my network at home, like, I'm really paranoid. I think my brother-in-law hates it because he comes with his iPhone, and he's, like, you know, he gets the lowest data, like, uh, plan from AT&T, so he's trying to save on money, and then he always goes on to someone's Wi-Fi. So was, he's always bumming off of someone's Wi-Fi. And then he says, hey, Alex, I want to connect to your network. What's the password? I said, Paul, it's not so easy. I also MAC address locked everything. So only my wife's iPhone, my, my phone, um, these set of laptops, my Roku, and a few others, they're MAC address certified and nothing else. And he gets like, how long is it going to take? Well, I need to turn on my computer and then log on to the router and then add your uh, MAC address. And he's like, he gives up in frustration, turns on data. And I'm like, <laughs> and this happens every time. I know, I have to tease him. He always teases me because I thought I was cheap. He's way cheaper. And he always says, hey, you should get solar panels out. You're just wasting money. And it's like, ah. anyways. So I like this little bit of like brother-in-law retribution. So it is possible to spoof this, OK? Mac, um, IP addresses, not so much. So if you have like the 192, 168 business, that is universally known as an internal network IP address. So you would do that if you have a home network and you're trying to dole out IP addresses and you don't want to, like, you know, um, what happens is and all these guys go through a single router, that's okay. The rest of the world will see the, the IP address of your router, but then hiding behind it is this internal network. But if you go on the World Wide Web, if you go onto the Wild West of the Internet, Everybody, theoretically, that's connected to it directly has a unique IP address. With the MAC address, it's not quite. Like, you know, there's enough combinations. And the spoofing is kind of tricky. You couldn't do that necessarily on the internet. Like, oh, here's another IP address of the exact same digits and stuff. You would have some issues with that. So you have MAC address. You have MAC protocol. So what's a MAC protocol? Medium access control. So what we saw in the last lecture with T TDMA, CDMA, FDMA, that's part of the MAC protocol. So, OK, we have a framework where we have these frequency slices. I'm going to give a frequency slice to you, a frequency slice to you, a frequency slice to you guys there to have that communications. And then there's a way of, oh, you're going to start communications? Start at this time. Start. So there's a process where, you, like, you know, the MAC protocol, what it does is it enables everybody to play by a certain set of rules, right? Wi-Fi, same thing, but the rules there are first come, first serve, right? And we'll talk a little bit about later in this course. For cellular networks, the rules are very regimented. It's a very efficient network. Everyone's allocated a time and a frequency. This is where you play at this time. Otherwise, we kick you off the network, right? So the MAC address does the um, uh, uniquely identifies the hardware. And then the MAC protocol tells how the hardware plays with the uh, accessing of the network. And then there's reliable de uh, delivery transmission. So this thing is basically, did you get my information? Yes, I did. 
Or, did you get my information? No, he didn't. Let me retransmit. So it's kind of like, you know, lame, but, but it does, does work, especially when it's fast. Flow control. This allows your frames to proceed from the source node to the target node, the destination node. So what happens is you don't also, like, you know, let's say you're sending data out. You don't want to send all this data, and then the other end cannot process it. So it really is throttling of those frames from end to end. And then the error detection. This is really important. So this is implemented on the hardware. It detects errors. And then this is where you, you ask, let's say, the transmitter, hey, I didn't get that. That's corrupted. If you don't have a mechanism for correcting. If you know that there's a guy, he sent it, you didn't quite get it, what do you do? Like, let's say I'm talking with my wife, and then I'm at one end of the room or one end of the house, and she's at the other, and she's very soft-spoken. And then all I hear is, rah, 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 tomorrow night. I'm like, what? Because what happens is two outcomes happen. I either do the what, and she retransmits, or it's a dropped packet, and then I don't know what we're doing tomorrow night. And then all of a sudden, like, I come home, and she says, are you ready to go? Go where? Right? So what happens is error detection says, there's an error. You didn't quite get that. And the two outcomes is you retransmit or you drop the information entirely. And then you try, maybe with some other techniques, reconstruct it later on. Or you just get a glitch, right? So let's say, for instance, if you do voice over IP, and this is kind of an annoying thing. So if you transmit and some of your packets are dropped, what happens? You might be missing a, few a bit of information. You might not hear all the speech. It might get glitchy for a bit. Right? Like, for instance, this is the best, best example, and I'm going crazy. So I'm not sure about you guys. Actually, I want to ask, how many people here subscribe to AT&T? AT&T users? Woo! Verizon users? OK, we're outnumbered here, AT&T guys. Sprint? Woo! I did, a, I did a project for Sprint many years ago. Great. T-Mobile. <sighs> well, that's how they say it in Germany. You go to Germany, it's like T-Mobile, and they're like, what are you talking about? Oh, T-Mobile. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what happens is, so what happens is it turns out that when, like, um, at least my, my, my phone got upgraded automatically uh, by the network to Lollipop. Uh, so I think that's version 5 or whatever. It turns out there's a small issue with some phones regarding Bluetooth connectivity. And that's a perfect example of error detection or lack thereof. So I would be on speakerphone, or I would have my Bluetooth headset, and would, it would actually start getting glitchy. I would hear, like, let's say some sound would get through, and then it would be intermittent stops and stuff. That's unacceptable, right? And that's something that ultimately, um, you know, the, the, something in, probably related to flow control. There's just too much information. It's not being processed. It's a very narrow bandwidth, and it's dropping packets. So what happens is my phone conversation is garbage. Do I want to pay AT&T X number of dollars to pay for that? No, absolutely not. So I have to find a fix. But that's an example of like an audio signal. And let's say you're missing every second word. The communication begins to fail, right? Unless you can somehow retransmit or recreate that missing information. Finally, there's half duplex and full duplex. And that's that we've talked about that before. So uh, we can transmit. Or we can receive, but not at the same time with the other guy on the line. Not like a telephone. So link layer, you have the sender. The sender wraps the datagram from the network layer. He encapsulates the datagram into a frame and adds check, uh, error checking bits. The RTD for controlling the, um, like, uh, um, if you need to retransmit any information, flow control, and all that stuff. So, that's where that additional information, so we have our payload, we have our datagram, we have the information from the network layer, what it needs. And then it adds all this additional stuff to protect the data as it goes from link layer down. <laughs> Likewise, the receiver receives the frames from the physical layer. It looks for errors, so now it's starting to use that additional data that's inserted into the frame. So are there any errors? Are there? How do you detect them? There are three techniques that we're going to be looking at. And then it does the RTD, I mean RDT. It's like, oh, I think there's an error. Can you please retransmit? OK, here's the new data. OK, everything checks out. Flow control. All this sort of additional overhead to make sure the data gets received correctly. And then finally, the information extraction. So this is what 
what's really important here it, it, with respect to link layer. So link layer is supposed to ensure, yes. Um, when, it, when it does the rechecking, does it yeah. ask for just a specific frame to be rechecked or, or a length of frames? So unfortunately, so that's an engineering trade-off. That's an excellent question. So what happens is when you retransmit, it's like retransmit the frame. Now what happens is a frame could be either very small or very large. So on the one hand, we would love to have the frame to be immensely large because you know that overhead stuff? We want to keep that as small as possible and just have as much data in there. But if we get an error in the frame, the entire frame gets thrown out. And so it's like, oh shoot, I have to retransmit the whole frame all over again. So it's really a trade-off. That's an excellent question. So I would love to have a huge frame with a little bit of overhead, that, that header information, and lots of data. But if one part of it's corrupted, you retransmit the whole frame. And that's bad news. So that's an excellent question. That's, that's one of those engineering trade-offs. means you have to have headers, headers for each one, and, and that's passed on to each one. Ex exactly. So, so what happens is the throughput, the amount of data with overhead is the same, but there's something called good put. And good put is essentially what is the percentage of data relative to all the data being transmitted over. So if someone says, hey, what's the good put of your network? That's what it means. It means the ratio, the percentage of data that you're transmitting that's actually information and not just like, you know, just overhead. Because you can have tons of overhead. What you really want is data. So you can see all those cat videos. <laughs> so. <laughs> Actually, I saw yesterday a chipmunk video, but that was really insane. So error detection, this is our techniques for protecting the information. And there's three basic techniques, parity checking, internet checksum, and cyclic redundancy check. Parity check, what you've got is you've got a little bit of information tacked on as, as the, uh, like not the header, but the footer of your frame. And what it does is there's an equation that goes right through your datagram. And what happens is this equation says, like in, in this case, you actually have, um, it's a very simple equation, but you can have more sophisticated approaches where if, let's say, you have this equation applied to your data, and then at the end it does not produce a 1 or a 0 or a small code word, it's like, oh, I think there's an error somewhere in that frame. And then you retransmit. So in the simplest case, the single parity check, what happens is you add one bit, and, it's, and if it's an even parity bit, what you've got is you have a parity bit added to seven bits and in order to make even number of ones. And what happens is the odd and odd number ones. So if you do the calculation and says, hey, I've got, um, you know, I have an odd parity bit, but I have an even number of ones, there's an error somewhere, and you just do the retransmit. And then two-dimensional parity bits, what you do is you add one bit to the seven-bit code and so you have eight bits, and you have even for even parity, odd for odd parity. So what it does is it, it's sort of a simple approach, and the other two techniques are a little bit more complicated. But what it is is, heads up, I think something here is not right. But of course, if you have two bit errors and they flip a zero and flip a one, you don't know. So it's not super reliable, but simple. Internet checksum. This is used as a transport layer, and what you've got is you have segments of data that contain 16-bit integers. You do the checksum, so you're adding one's complement to the segmented data. You send a checksum value by UDP checksum field, and you have a random access protocol, and the receiver calculates the checksum. So what this guy is doing, the one's complement sum, what you do is you sum up all the bits. Does it check out to the one's complement addition at the end of the day? If it does, there's no error or the error is really messed up and you missed it. If it doesn't check out, again, you flag it and you say, got to retransmit this thing. The last guy, and I'm, well, we might not have too much time left. So what the last guy does, the cyclic redundancy check, what it does is you have the message and both transmitter and receiver have a, a, as a word that if you do long division on that pattern, gives you a remainder and that's what's transmitted with your information. And if you do the long division at the receiver and doesn't match that word, you know there's an error. So in all these three cases, it says there's an error. Because that's actually the biggest problem. Is your data reliable? If it's not, 
you got to know about it. If you don't know about it, that's like that evil that's hiding, hiding in there. And you've you got to identify that first. So anyways, uh, that kind of summarizes a little bit about um, error detection. So that concludes lecture seven. <laughs>